Well, welcome to the January uh, 2022 session for the Center for Free Enterprise. I'm Eric Schwartz, your Zoom God and host, and um, uh, we're excited today to uh, be talking with some very uh, successful, very qualified gentlemen about business, and um, that discussion can be led by Ben. Um, I'd like to first open up by first thanking our sponsors. And uh, those sponsors are uh, the Calkins Law Firm, which Ben is uh, the head of, Cleveland Private Trust Company, which I'm the managing director of. We advise business owners and on their personal matters. Uh, Lightkowski and Company. Uh, Dave over there is a, a business type CPA who focuses on uh, business owners and entrepreneurs. Fast Forward Business Advisors, Creative Gold Media that does all our, our video improvements so that we can put them on the website for us. Um, and so we thank them without those sponsors, this would not be possible. Uh, also today, we'd like to welcome our guests, just briefly tell you who they are, if you don't already know. Uh, we've got uh, Ben Calkins, who's the uh, mediator of this discussion uh, with Ben with the Calkins Law Firm. Uh, Dennis, uh, Please shoot me in the head if I say this wrong, but I'm going to shoot at it. Uh, Keber Keberdal? Close enough. Close enough. Uh, he's manager and partner of Chicol, Chicol uh, Equities and Sentinel Services. Mark Kozel, uh, who's with Kozel Associates, and John Lane, who's with Inglewood and Associates. He's the CEO and managing director there. Uh, February 18th, we will be having Matt Hirsch with Alt Media. Alt Media uh, will be talking, he'll be talking about your internet presence um, and all that goes with it. So that should be interesting and a little bit of a change of pace from, from what we normally talk about, um, some more professional development type conversation. In March, uh, I will be having a conversation and interviewing Rebecca Morgan, who has just written a book about manufacturing and manufacturing operations that uh, has done very well on Amazon and on the New York Times. Uh, so we're excited about that as well. Um, I guess that's all the business we have. Just to remind you, if you have any questions during this conversation, please chat me in the chat box and I will uh, introduce that question into the uh, discussion. And then when we're all done with this, we will do our breakout rooms and um, and do a little bit of networking like we always have done, okay? So uh, without further ado, Ben, I will let you take it away. Okay, great. Thank you, Eric, and uh, greetings, everyone. We're pleased to have such an esteemed and distinguished panel with us today. Uh, let's start by, <clears throat> I have a few questions to kick this off, and let's start by going in, uh, reverse alphabetical order. So we'll go from John to Mark to Dennis. And my first question would be, what are each of you seeing happening in the region's businesses in this current environment? Uh, thank you, Ben. Um, and thank you for this opportunity to speak to everyone. Uh, it, you know, it's really a mixed bag. Um, you know, you've got some companies that are uh, in a, a great industry that's in high need and they're doing outstanding. Uh, you've got other folks who are, um, you know, just unfortunately, their product's not needed as much, and, and, and they are struggling. Uh, everyone is dealing with, um, you know, issues of labor and, and um, the supply chain issues. Uh, but I think the real question is, um, you know, how are, how are they handling those issues? Um, you know, how are they, are they running their business efficiently or not? Because uh, there's, there's plenty of opportunities to improve uh, in a difficult situation, and there's plenty of great opportunities in a difficult situation. So, um, I'll turn it over to, I guess, Mark there, uh, let him continue. Yeah, I, I would agree, uh, John, with your, with your assessment. And also, I think that a lot of what's going on is somewhat disguised or somewhat clouded by uh, the governmental support that we've had for the last year and a half. And as that winds down and as that uh, as, as interest rates begin to rise, which the, the Fed has promised to do two or three or four times this year, I think that will really tell the story about what's going to happen with businesses and, and, uh, and what happens to industry in general. Dennis? I, um, 
I agree with the comments you guys have made. We're beginning to see a little different um, attitude uh, from lenders uh, than we have over the last year or two. In, in the last two weeks, uh, we've been contacted about three times as many companies as we worked on the last three months. And everybody I think is holding their breath, wondering what's gonna happen. And what we can see, like John mentioned, there's some people that are in the right place doing well, so others that are getting squeezed, but there's all kinds of very, very interesting opportunities um, that you can take, uh, take advantage of with this transition. I think if the people that stand up, pay attention, make sure they know where they're going with their companies can really come out of this so much stronger. So we're, we're, we're adopting that, uh, you know, we're adopting that uh, approach. And because otherwise you can sit in the corner and cry all day long, or you can actually do something. Yeah. I just think this is one of those times that we can. Well, I think, okay, you know, that's, one of the a good, big, that's a good, go ahead, John. Yeah. I, ahead, I think John. one of the, the, the issues, unfortunately, it's a little bit uh, too late for a lot of folks. Uh, the question, as, as Mark said, a lot of folks got a, a ton of PPP money um, and, you know, that saved a lot of companies bacon. Uh, the question is, what did they do at, with that money? You know, did they say, okay, I'm in a great situation now. I've got, I finally have some extra cash. I can do some good things to my business. Or do they say, that's okay. I've saved myself. I'm good. I could just keep on doing what I've been doing all along. Um, those that did the latter are, are going to be finding themselves in some trouble. Uh, hope, You're talking you know, about 80% of the people, John, with the latter, don't you think? Most say that people, again? About 80% of the people are your latter. Because uh, I, I would hope to be optimistic and say more, but I tend to agree with you. Yeah, it's because we've never, how do you prepare yourself for this? And the, uh, because we do so much business like, like you do as well, but with family businesses, how do you prepare for this and everything else that goes with it? And then all the heavy duty activity that's gone on with private equity and the rest because money was so cheap and available. Everybody's looking for some way to uh, do better. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm just a little worried. We don't have our feet down to do what we got to do, but you know, if you're aware of it and do something, I think there's just a great opportunity for us, especially. Okay. Let me, let me try another question and let me on this one, Mark, you go first and then John and then uh, Dennis. And this is a, a broad question, but I think it will be of interest to our audience. Where do opportunities lie in this climate for the entrepreneur or investor, perhaps in our audience, who wishes to step up and get involved and take advantage? We start there's with Mark. Al there's always opportunities in, in business to look at companies that aren't doing what they, what they could be doing, but have the potential to. And that's the big, uh, the big thing is to look at organizations and say, okay, they may not be performing as well right now, but what can they do? And, and how do we get there? You know, most importantly is, is, uh, you know, it, does the company have what it will take or do I have to bring in additional talent? What kind of an investment uh, monetarily and, and uh, people wise is going to be necessary? But there's always those opportunities, and it's seeing through the muck uh, and, and saying, okay, beneath all of that, we've got a real diamond here that we can, we can really make uh, some money with. John? Yeah, uh, cl uh, clearly, I agree. Uh, you you, you want to find a company that's got good bones. I mean, they're, that, you know, they're strategically well-placed. I mean, they've got a good product, um, you know, good service. And, um, you know, it's, you know, it's just they're maybe, you know, stubbing their toe a bit. The best situation would be a company that for whatever reason uh, is cash short. You know, that is their primary issue is that they don't have the cash they need to run the business because then you've got a great opportunity to work with the company, potentially work with the bank, buy the debt um, and, and, you know, help them, you know, give them, inject the cash they need so they could run properly. That's, that would be the ideal situation to look for. Dennis? I, I agree. Um, I think we, we have that transition though, as much as everything is the same, everything's different. And the, the, uh, the problems with people, all the government added support, you know, we keep hearing about infrastructure bills, we keep hearing about all these things, 
yet we appear to be stuck in neutral uh, in, in many ways from what we are hoping opportunities to be. And I, I just hope that a lot of the people that we've worked with over the years have been smart enough, like you mentioned, John, you know, the, to, to be in the right place at the right time and have the bones underneath. And, and the other big bones, let's face it, the people that have held on and taken care of their people, their key people, are the ones that are going to be able to be in position to take advantage of these opportunities. And all the stuff on TV about finding people and the rest, well, you know, the key may be $10 million companies, it's time for them to get a little robotics and the rest of the stuff, just like a $100 million company would have five years ago. And with uh, that transition and everything else, I, I, I just think those that have their head up, like you mentioned, are going to just be something special. It's almost like a rebirth of American middle market businesses. I just well, and also change. another thing with respect to the labor, uh, it, what goes around comes around. You know, if, if you uh, don't treat your employees properly, you beat up on them, um, you're going to you're at the greatest risk. Of, of losing people and also of having the greatest challenge of finding people because you have a bad reputation. Uh, so if you, uh, you know, have a great reputation for a great company to work with, treat your people fairly, um, you know, this labor issue may not be as great for you as it might be for others. Yeah, that, that and the, the actual cost of people, I think is starting to really come out for, for people. Uh, we just finished with a, a 105 uh, employees in a company and they couldn't understand what was different. And uh, dad, 78 or 80. And so he kind of still signs the checks, but he didn't change the hospitalization. And I can't get over family coverage, even in the Midwest, $2,500 to $3,000 a month for hospitalization. So you're spending $35,000 a year on somebody making $20 an hour, making $40,000 in wages. I mean, you, you, you think about what those costs are We've got to find a way to make that work, to give people a reason to stay with you as the owners or the management of the company, but not only that, to position yourself for the next five to 10 years of insanity. So it's, it's, an, it's an interesting timing. Okay, I think Eric, you have a question, don't you? Do you wanna jump in? Yeah, Mike Hammer, um, our friend says, I would, think that overseas supply chain issues, there'd be a lot of opportunities to bring some of that back onshore. They just announced an Intel ship uh, fabrication plant uh, here in Ohio by Columbus, and it should generate a lot of opportunities. I don't see a question there, but just a statement. Okay, no, I mean, there, there certainly there are opportunities. I mean, the the other aspect is is looking at where um, the biggest supply chain issues might be. You know, right now they're mostly on the West Coast. So if you're sourcing from China, you, you're going to have more problems. But if you uh, maybe source out of um, you know South America, you know, I understand that the port in Miami is not quite as jammed up. So there are opportunities there, but also um, you know figuring out how to. Uh, who knows where the supply chain issues are going to go in the long term? So if you could bring some production uh, to this back to the states, that you know it might be might be a good thing. Yeah, more than just production, because where does the raw material come from? We just finished a project for a PE firm. They had a plant um, just just across the border in Mexico. They bought one in Ohio. They have one in outside of St. Louis, and then naturally they have a little one over in Vietnam, uh, which is mostly run by Chinese as small businesses and we're ever since the war, but where does the raw material or the next stage of material go? So it's not just throw a plant in the US, there's more to it and the supply chain has really, really changed. So I don't think there's gonna be an easy quick answer. There's, there's gotta be integrated movement and you know, you, you've gotta be all in it together. So it'll be interesting uh, I, to see what the government I, does, especially with duties. So I, I agree with Dennis. I, you know, if, if you look back uh, last winter, we had, you know, as I recall, we had a big problem uh, in Texas. Things froze up and it affected the petrochemical industry. And that that reached out into all sorts of industries. We we had our, our house recited 
And uh, there was a delay, an enormous delay to getting product because plants weren't making the chemicals. They had to recover and, and get back up and, and they had a backlog at that point. And so what would normally take a couple of weeks to get product took four, five, six months to get product. So all I, I think the, the, the secret, if you will, going forward uh, is that companies have got to be versatile. You've got to adjust and continue to make changes all the time. Uh, it can't be, we've got our plan, here's what we do, our customers love us and we move along because <clears throat> you may not be able to get the materials, you may not be able to keep your employees because your competitor is, is looking to say, you know, uh, Dennis is a pretty good guy, maybe we ought to snag him, we'll pay him a little bit more and, and we can bring his expertise to our organization. So you, you got to be versatile and you got to pay attention to the details in today's environment. Yeah, plus they'd be saying that about John, the pretty nice guy thing. I haven't heard that about me in at least 30 years. So I appreciated that. Thank you. I, I was trying to be nice, Dennis. Well, okay. okay. <laughs> Okay, guys, and any one of you can jump in on this one. How does one business buy another business after the buyer has had a tough year? Uh, the answer is don't. <laughs> you don't. Next question. <laughs> you beat me to it, John. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you know, the problem is when someone's in trouble, they're always looking for a panacea. And, and so they're sitting there and they're saying, you know, we're struggling. Let's let's go buy a business and maybe they'll fix our problems. Well, you know, all you're going to do is probably add bad problems to your own bad problems and, and then have the whole issue of assimilation and it's just a mess. So, uh, you know, you know, clean up your, your own sandbox before you acquire another one. Amen. Okay. Because, you know, depending upon the organization, you know, you could have, you know, all sorts of issues uh, and, and just compound the problems you have in your own house. So you got to clean your own house before you can go out and incur more problems. Well, but you also have to be opportunistic. I, I just, I keep coming back to this. I know I get caught in a rut. I'll probably get a nasty email from my brother. Stop saying it. Um, I just think we're in one of those cycles where there's great opportunity. And I think dealing with all the issues that we're talking about today and all that is fine but you've got to have your head screwed on straight and say, how does this help our company? Or how can we do this and do that? And, you know, the trouble is the last couple of years is money being so cheap and multiples paid. I wish this happened back when we owned companies. I'd be sitting on a boat outside of Santorini, Greece, talking to you guys, you know, uh, with the kind of multiples and stuff that's, that's going on. But I, I, just, I just think if we can focus again and get away from all the negativity and all that, we, we can get there because let's face it, the rest of the world doesn't have what we have. You know, we still have who our country is and our, we're allowed to get, you know, give it a shot. And uh, it's time for us in our segment of the world where we advise, we help, um, all the other stuff. We've got to go into it this time with a positive attitude. It's so different. Uh, back in the eighties, I, I had Japanese partners. Um, if you guys remember all the stuff with the Japanese currency, and all that. And I just couldn't, couldn't get over it. My first time standing in the Ginza and with the president of Komatsu. And he said, do you know you're standing on $1 million, Dennis? And I looked at him. I, all I wanted to do was say, what are you, crazy? And, uh, and then, you know, then their whole world blew up and we are where we are. Let's just don't make those mistakes again. Let's take advantage of where we are. I, I just think it's time. I have that feeling. Hey guys. Right. I, have another, so I, have okay. a, I have another question. How does a business get a loan after it has had a rough year in the, you know, in the current climate? Or does it not get a loan? It just has to figure things out. How does a business that has had some stress deal with the lender? Um, I, if you like, I could answer that. I mean, okay. it, it actually, you know, we, we've had the, dealt with those situations. Uh, it's, it's, it's key if you've had a lot of problems. And for example, we had a client where it was, uh, they had profitable for 12 years. And then the 13th year was just incredibly bad year. They had a perfect storm of issues. Um, and what, what they did was to fully analyze what those issues were. They developed a, a plan how to fix all those. Um, then they also started implementing that as well. 
Um, and then, um, and then, so then we went to the, when we went to the banks, we, we did a full open kimono type, uh, approach. We said, here's all the issues this company, uh, has had. We didn't hide a single thing. Uh, and we said, here's each one of the issues and here is the plan. And by the way, they've already started implementing and here are the immediate results that they're having. And then you could, you have to show bridge things for the bank. You need to show you know, here's where last year was, and here's where we could be next year based on this action plan. Uh, and if you don't do that, you're going to have a, a heck of a time trying to find financing. I agree with, with John entirely. It's all about communication. It's about showing here's where we've been, here's where we're, we're going, and here's how we're getting there. Because uh, you've got to reassure the bank that you've got control of your own business, that it's not a wish list. It's not a, uh, a yeah, we think we can do better or uh, the, the infamous, we've got a big order coming in. It'll change everything, you know. Um, but if you've, if you've got your hands on the business, you understand it and can communicate that, then you can build trust with your lender and then you can talk about, OK, you know, to get through this next stage, we're going to need this. And, and here's why it's important to you. And here's why you're not at risk. Isn't it amazing uh, I, I, to Dennis and, and to Mark uh, how companies will sit there and say, well, we don't want to tell the bank anything. Oh, yeah. they're, just, they're just going to do bad stuff to us. So let's let's keep this all quiet. Yeah, exactly. So the big key and I think you you hit it, Mark, is there are no secrets in the end. I mean, mm -hmm. let's face it, especially with our new world, with the computers and everything else, it's just, I, I find it so interesting. Management doesn't realize that the bank can read between the lines or their investors understand they've done it before. You know, there's very little that is truly novel and new. And I agree, you, you come up with, and you all you have to do is monetize Here's where I'm at. Here's why I have an issue. Here's what I'm changing. One and one equals two. And, it, and we, we have one right now. We're doing a collateral audit for a bank. And believe it or not, they have $3 million on the borrowing base. We found 280,000. And there's no inventory on computer printouts or anything else. They have 600 handwritten sheets. Of course, they're on their third lender in the last nine years. Um, and, and with that stuff, and they don't want to put it in computer because then somebody could check them. Believe it or not, they actually said that to us. And I, I don't know, sometimes it amazes me how people manage to be successful in spite of themselves. Of course, you know, we were a classic example. We did the same stupid things, but I, I agree with you guys. Be forthcoming, explain to people where you're taking it, what the opportunity is, because the bank is in a business of lending you money. As long as you get past all the, uh, I got to watch what I say here, uh, all the uh, uh, pluses and minuses that they got to put paperwork in. If I can lend you 10 million instead of 5 million, I've got a bigger loan, make twice as much money. Give me a reason to go along with you. And uh, yeah, if you can, you, you really want to create a, a partnership with your bank uh, because, in, 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 and the, as you guys mentioned, uh, the trust, the confidence, um, because then, you know, when you do run into trouble and you talk to the bank and say, hey, you know, and, and you tell them it's coming down the pike before it shows up, you, you don't want to tell the bank that, hey, last month this happened. What you want to say is in two months, we think this is going to happen and I might need your help. The bank's much more likely to help you in those circumstances. Exactly. Exactly. All right. I have another question that comes out of our uh, prep session. And I'll just throw it out there and you can all speak to it. And that is, if a business wants to, let's say a reasonably successful business wants to acquire a struggling business right now that might be a good fit, uh, how would a, the business, the acquirer, go about finding the business to acquire? That's the first question. And then part B of the question, it's a compound question, would be, how do you value the business that's going to be acquired when that business during the pandemic, during these strange times has been uh, underperforming? Do you just value it based on that underperformance or do you, is there some sort of a pass given to in valuations to these crazy times? I throw that out there. 
how do we find the business to acquire? And then how do you value a business that has been underperforming during these strange times? Well, I, I can I can jump in, um, which I'm apt to uh, apt to do, or usually would do. Um, <laughs> the uh, it is it is um, it's a lot of hard work uh, to find a business. If you're a single executive, you just retired, and you're looking to buy a business, there's a lot of you uh, out there doing the exact same thing, and so you you have to be able to differentiate yourself. Networking can help a bit, but it, it's 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 kind of tough. To, to just broadly go out there and meet with people and say, I'm looking for a business. I mean, you you need to leverage on whatever your experience is. If you're an individual, what company were you in? That's where your skill sets are. That's where your knowledge is um, and pursue something like that. It's much easier for businesses that uh, who own, you know, if you've got the business already and you wanna add on, uh, then you've got all kinds of synergy opportunities when you bring the companies together. Um, you know, with respect to uh, buying um, a distressed company, it, it's a it's a great great opportunity. I mean, you're um, first of all assuming you you don't buy it in an auction situation uh, where there's a lot of competition, uh, you can you might be able to buy the business for you know uh, one or two times EBITDA. You know, depending on how many challenges the base the company is facing. Uh, the other aspect is that you might be able to pay, um, you know, some number slightly above liquidation value for the the assets. Uh, so you you know you really can buy it for for a, a low price most likely. And the really cool thing is, you know, if you're paying one or two times EBITDA, and the, and there's there's three dollars and fifty cents of EBITDA, uh, you're not you know you're not paying much for the business. You know, and you grow that business, you get it up to a million million and a half of EBITDA. Well, ultimately, you're going to be able to sell it for you know four or five, six times EBITDA. So you really get a two for um, when you do um, pursue uh, distressed companies. Okay, Mark or Dennis, am, uh, am I still on this? I got all kinds of goopy screens that popped up. <laughs> we see you. We hear you. Okay, yeah. then the heck with it. Um, I, I I agree that you know we're not again we're in that transition period when we have a change in the economy or or everything else. And uh, over the last couple of years, some of the multiples being paid, given the value of public companies and access to capital, have gotten everybody think that their business is worth a 10 multiple. Uh, and you know, they, it can be, it can't be, and, and all the rest of it. But getting people to realize uh, what it's really worth, one from the seller side, to maximize recovery and value to the seller, but two to the, buy, the buyer, to show them how you put it together to really uh, get it together. I just think it's important that you go about it and do the work to show what the value really is and not just slap things together to maximize today. Because let's face it, with these computers and everything else, it's not very often we see 600 sheets of paper with handwritten. There's enough stuff there. It's a question of what do you do? So I I, I agree with your, your thoughts there, John, but I'm also troubled a little bit because everybody's used to hitting a home run every time they get up to bat to sell the companies. And uh, when I when I bring a buyer in and I've got a five multiple on a non-technical company and da 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 and somebody says, oh, you're an idiot. My good buddy got 10 multiple. What the, why the hell should I take this? So I, we're in that transition period where I think we need everybody, the, the legal world that work with business owners, the banks, uh, those of us that lend a helping hand and get it ready, we all got to make sure that we're being clear, actually do the work and uh, hope nobody takes us the wrong way. Stop slopping stuff together. You're just expecting to get the top buck. You, know, you actually got to do the work. Yeah, uh, it, it, that, that is true. Because just, just as you said, Dennis, there's an expectation with computers today. There's an expectation that you, you should know what uh, your product costs you know, what your profitability is by product, um, you know, and then the only other thing is, and, and I, I, I don't want to stomp on uh, Mark's toes too much, but the, uh, excuse the expression, but size matters. I mean, you know, you could take a company, the exact same company that has an EBITDA of, of $500,000 a year, and, and they think that they could sell for, you know, the same multiple of a company that had 5 million EBITDA um, and it doesn't work that way. Um, you know, the, the bigger company has 
you know, much more critical mass and, and much more opportunity to grow than the, the 500,000 EBITDA. Well, that, that and getting the information together for presentation to be able to show where the value is and, and all the rest of it, uh, it's, there's more to it. And uh, I think it's just gonna get, gonna get a little tougher as we go forward to demonstrate true value because everybody knows everything. And uh, it, it's gonna be very interesting, but once again, I think we're entering a time that if somebody wants to build a business or grow a business uh, or get out, you know, we, we've been working in articles and stuff. We do so much family business work. There's so many people my age, you know, a little older than 46 um, that have, that are in the second or third generation of the family business, but their kids have gone off to school. Uh, they're off doing something else. There's nobody to pass it on to. So we have that transition going on. So it's a great opportunity for those of us in business assistants, banks, attorneys, all, all that stuff. But at the same time, the expectation and making sure you take care of people. It's, uh, I don't know, I, I just think it's gonna be a wild next uh, four or five years. Could be very, very good fun. That in with all the insanity on the coast and the world becoming shrinking, the international because of these computers and stuff, the Midwest is going to be the source of a lot of opportunity. And uh, I, I just think the next couple of years, uh, we're, we're going to walk into a, I, I shouldn't say bar, should I, into a coffee shop uh, and see each <laughs> other and say, are you really working with that crazy sucker? Yes, we are. Yeah. And, uh, but you know what? It sure, it sure beats sitting on our hand and hoping that we don't cough on somebody for the last couple of years. I'm so sick of that too, so. Right. You know, and I and I think when when you're looking at sales of company and acquiring companies from a company standpoint, it's also a timing issue. You know, did things go south? So you just put a for sale sign on the front lawn or did you look and say, you know, we're, we're doing OK or, you know, it's time to retire. But, you know, if we take those 600, you know, bill of material cards and or inventory cards and we computerize them and we do this and this and this then we've got a much more attractive company. So let's put, you know, six months or, or, you know, a year into this and really turn this thing around so we can get that huge multiple that John down the street got when he sold his company. Because exactly. he's got all those controls and, and we don't. And, hey. you know, if you look at it from a, from a business owner standpoint, that's the way to maximize your return. From, you know, from an investor standpoint, if you can deal with the 600 inventory cards, you could get a pretty good deal and, and be able to do that work yourself and, and then turn that company around. So it's, you know, different sides of the same coin. Yep. I, one of our guys is at that factory today. He drove from St. Louis over, I won't tell you what other city it is, uh, but he's, he's translating those 600 pages and uh, we will have the book ready within the next three weeks, no matter what it takes us. Yeah, so you're right. Let on. me ask, let me transition a little bit. I have a couple more questions. And we, of course, we encourage questions from the audience. All of you guys have a lot of experience in turnaround business generally, and a vast wealth of experience. And I wanted to ask each of you and any one of you can start. John, you can start. How has the turnaround business changed or evolved from let's say 20 years ago, 20, 25 years ago to today, how, how has the whole business of turnarounds changed? I observed some change because my friend and the, the original uh, co-founder of the Center for Free Enterprise, David Brown, did turnarounds with uh, Larry Goddard back at the Parkland Group. And then by the time David and I started the Center for Free Enterprise uh, five, six years ago. David was not even doing turnarounds to any great extent. He was doing acquisition searches. So whatever his perch was in the turnaround business vanished. So how has the business of turnarounds changed? Uh, it, it, is, it has changed um, tremendously and not for the better. Um, the um, banks have a lot less patience. Granted, they had a period of time where, um, you know, over the last uh, couple of years, they they had to be a little kinder and gentler with you. Um, but the um, now, I mean, the 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 price, you know, the the price is going to have to be paid pretty soon. And 
you know, the banks look at their situations and they're saying, you know, I, I can't, I'm not going to take the risk. I can't afford to sit there and let this company try to figure out, you know, which direction is up. Um, I'm going to force a sale. Uh, they're going to, um, and then you go into receiverships, uh, you know, the receivership, there's, there's really only, well, not always. I mean, we've had some success in, 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 in getting companies out of receiverships, but generally the only exit of a receivership is a sale. And the same thing with bankruptcies. I mean, bankruptcies used to go for quite a period of time. And part of that, part of that is the changes in the bankruptcy law that took uh, place a few years ago, several years ago. Um, there's just a lot of pressure to, uh, to get the case closed, to, to resolve the issues, and nobody has any patience. So, you know, you want to avoid, you know, another way of looking at it is when you get into trouble, the sooner you recognize you're in trouble, you know, the better. You have more options at that point. If you sit there and just kind of put your head in the sand for a long period of time, the number of options that you have available go down. Of uh, they get fewer and fewer and fewer. And if you're sitting there looking at a potential receivership or bankruptcy, you know, you you, you might as well say goodbye to your company because you're 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 about about done. Okay, they flush you now, then they flush you down. It's not they don't give you a little bit of an opportunity to get things together. Uh not not a lot. It's right. not not uh, the leash is short. Yeah. Exactly. Year, years ago, totally bankruptcy was, was a more uh, attractive op option for companies because, you know, the bankruptcy laws at that point kind of held banks uh, at bay and, and you, could, you could do a little bit more. And you, as John pointed out, you had the time to do it. But now there is no time. Now everything is on a fast track and people want, you know, want results. And while banks have been uh, somewhat patient the last couple of years, um, you know, those days are coming to an end. Of course, you know, I've been around long enough to say, I've heard that the banks are going to start generating a lot of work for the turnaround folks since probably 2000. And in this industry, we've all been waiting for that day, praying for that day, but it hasn't <laughs> occurred yet. Uh, there's been a lot of kick the can down the road. There's been a lot of, we don't care what you do, just go find another bank. Uh, and so loans get traded a lot and, and we've all, you know, made money helping companies get new lenders. So uh, it's just a different scenario, uh, maybe less kinder, if you will, and, and more uh, ag aggressive uh, from a timing standpoint. Dennis, would you agree? Oh, absolutely. I, banking used to be a relationship. My first loan uh, back in the day. Cleveland Trust and uh, the banker, we were borrowing $51,000, our first company back in, I think, 83. Uh, the banker made me bring my wife and we sat across from him and uh, he wanted to meet us. And naturally, three or four months in, we got into trouble. And, uh, but we got everybody paid off within the first year and, and he invited us back. And he said, you see why I wanted you two in? What he, I wanted to see what kind of people you were. He had a new loan document written up for 150,000 so we could go back and recharge the business. We were in the material handling business and restart and go over it. They turned around and lent us more money. And uh, you know, five years later, we bought the Alice Chalmers lift truck uh, company for $60 million. You know? So it, it, it was a different time. Today, fill out the computer stuff, wave to each other like we are online here and uh, keep it going. So I think the banking business has become less personal and more uh, driven on the data. The way John mentioned earlier, you know, having the data to show the bank why and the rest that it is, um, it's, it's a transition period. And I think your comment about the change and how things are working today and the timing is quite true. But we just, that just means those of us in the support, let's face it, the turnaround business, whether you're lawyer or operational, or finance, you're there to assist. Because if we assist the company in becoming successful again, the bank gets taken care of. The investors get taken care of. Uh, the owners get taken care of. You know, vendors, everybody. So I, I've kind of a, uh, adjusted my behavior from, you know, in the, back in the day when we first started doing this after we sold our last company in 99, you, know, you come in through the front door, if they won't unlock it, we kick the door in and walk in. Here we are. Uh, you know, it was a little different today. It's 
oh, thank you very much. And so it's, it's this process that, that John described, uh, the shift and how, how to make it work. I just think with our experience, those of us that have been around for a while, blending in with the energy of like we have in our company, I call it the farm team. I've got four guys under 40. And you know my fingernails are older than 40 years old. So it's a, it's a, it's a different, uh, different grouping that we've got to adjust our support for the things that need to be done. And I think those of us that are on the front line, uh, I guess all of us on here, I think we, you know, we deal with the day-to-day -day stuff. We've not seen the kind of work like you, we keep expecting for the last 10 years. You know, the world's coming to an end. We're gonna be driven to the wall. No, we have to adjust what we're doing for people. Uh, my son's a bankruptcy lawyer, international. And to listen to him talk about projects it's stuff I haven't heard in 30 years. And I think that's us too. You know, as, as much as these computers have uh, given us more to work with, it's almost like our business has become more personal again. And we have to prepare companies for what needs to be done. So I, I, I do think it's a great opportunity for those of us that are committed to fixing things and not just flush it down the drain. So it's, it's going to be an interesting 10 years. We have a question, I think, Eric, don't we? Or maybe more than one. Do you want to jump in? Indeed we do. Uh, so Tim Morris asked the question, how long do you see the super tight labor market continuing? Is this a temporary situation due to COVID that improves as COVID receives? Or is this more of a generational structural dynamic that lasts longer? I think um, uh, it's going to yeah, last longer, and and, uh, and I think it's going to last longer simply because um, with COVID and everything, there's been a lot of, you know, work from home, you know, work remotely, et cetera. And I think people are looking, going, okay, is this really what I want to do, or do I want to open, you know, that... Uh, that service station, or do I want to open, you know, that retail outlet, or do I want to, you know, carve figurines or whatever? Um, and they're starting to, you know, to do things part time, and it grows into a business. Uh, there's things that, you know, people are. I, I saw a headline the other day that people are making, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars doing, you know, stuff online. Uh, and and influencing and and TikTok and this it's like I don't even know what half of this stuff is and people are making more than CEOs of companies uh, doing this kind of stuff so I think the entire economy has shifted a bit and I don't see it unshifting anytime real soon I think it's something that companies are going to have to continue to deal with and and look and say okay how do we uh, a make our company uh, attractive to uh, individuals, and how do we make the jobs that we're asking people to fill fulfilling for those employees as well, so that it's a win for all of us? Yeah, that's that's an interesting point. Uh, uh, I was talking to a, a good friend of mine who was uh, he's now retired at retired at fifty five. He was the head of the Cleveland office of uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers, and he gave a presentation on how they dealt with employees. Now, I started with Price Waterhouse back in 1976, and, you know, if, if um, you know, they rewarded me by beating me with a stick. Um, you know, these days, it's now, I mean, it's much more focused on, um, you know, uh, attending to people's needs, um, and, uh, you know, the companies that aren't prepared to, you know, be a bit more focused on its employees are going to have a problem. And then the only other thing I'll, I'll also mention is, I, I think, and, and being an older older gentleman, the, I think I, I talked to a lot of my friends or my contemporaries, and there's just a lot of people saying, you know, it just with COVID, it just it just isn't worth it anymore. You know, I'm I'm I, I I'm okay. I can I can retire, um, and so I'm just don't want to, especially since I've been at home for the last couple of years. I'm you know I'm just I'm just gonna stay fully at home. So I, I think there's a large a portion of the um, workforce that has just disappeared a little bit sooner than everyone expected. And I agree with you, Mark. I mean, it's gonna take a while for uh, things to uh, balance out. Yeah, it's, it's going to, we're seeing it. 
Uh, my, my son, like I mentioned, is a international bankruptcy attorney. His secretary, he's in Miami. And he started telling me what it costs her to come into the office. And then I talked to some of the folks in Cleveland, the bankers that have to go down. I never thought that somebody who worked for X bank and parks in X bank's building has to pay their own parking. And when you start adding up what it costs people to come into the office and be there. Uh, and then you start, you start looking what it costs for daycare for people's kids. My son was telling me that his secretary has two kids and, and she was spending $1,400 a month for daycare until she got home after her kids got out of school. And that's after tax dollars. Then you start talking about people parking in the big cities. And so the, the transition, our world, I think the computer stuff is gonna come of age. We're gonna be able to maximize people's time and do things, but we're all of an age. And I can see that nobody's 19 years old on this call that's in my uh, thing here. Uh, we still believe getting together with each other that one and one can equal three because people do things, it's not just a machine, but it's, it's changing. And I just think the companies uh, that we're working with, all of us have to change our perception on what the structure is to maximize what you get out of employees for what they cost. Because you, you can only afford to pay so much. We have a company in upstate Michigan, we have tool makers making $28 an hour that will not come back into the place and work, $28 an hour. I mean, we're not talking peanuts, they put a little overtime, they're making $70,000, but they get $1,100 a week to sit home and not go, not have all the other costs. So the adjustment to our structure for our businesses, I think is very important for those of us that are supporting companies with this transition. We've got to make sure we don't miss that. The way it was in 1976, John, See, I remember that. What do you think of that? That's the year I got married. So, but anyways, uh, what it, what it if was. If we have that? any more questions from the audience, oh, please. I'm sorry, I'll shut up. Okay. Okay, bring the questions now because in a few minutes we'll wrap up and we'll network. Meanwhile, I have a question. Dennis brought up uh, the, the easy, cheap money that's been out in the market for a long time. And with multiples been the way they are, and it's been a seller's market in business for, geez, probably over a decade. Now with the Fed starting to tighten, with rates starting to go up, they're talking about 50 basis points. Do you see that as, as affecting the market or being a catalyst for change anytime in the near future? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I clearly, I mean, they, it, it all depends on whether you've prepared well for uh, you know, your future or not. I mean, if you are barely profitable, you know, clearly, I mean, think of what, you know, with interest rates so low, 50 basis points is a huge percent, and that's going to very negatively impact your uh, bottom line. So as, as all three of us have been saying, um, you know, you, you know, prepare for stuff before it happens, um, you know, lower your costs, improve your efficiencies. Uh, and, um, you know, you know, someone, someone is ringing. <laughs> I got it. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, if, if you, you've, you've got, even if you think you're doing okay, figure out how to reduce costs and, and to improve efficiencies, because who knows where the interest rates uh, may go. And, and for many of the older folks on this uh, call, you know, think back to the, you know, early 1980s, uh, where interest rates were through the roof. And just imagine, right. how do you think you're going to run your business when interest rates are that high? Well, when, when the banks are offering the clients we're working with, all of us on here are experiencing it, uh, two and a half to 5% money. So let's say somebody's borrowing at 4%. Gee, if it only goes up 1%, what's the big deal? What's 25% more debt service on the interest side? And with the multiples set up in the lending agreements that you got to have one and a half to one or two to one, all of a sudden, I need 25% more cash flow to just avoid getting blown up. So these changes that are coming, they should have happened sooner, the politicians with all their garbage, and it would have come in more gradually. But to get to where it needs to go and what's gonna happen, it's gonna be very, very dramatic. No two ways about it. 
It is. And but the, the good thing is that the, the Fed is pretty much telegraphed. Here's what we here's what we what we see and what we're going to be doing this year. You know, they've already said three to four you know rate increases. Now, maybe they won't. But with that kind of advance notice, businesses need to prepare to say, OK, if my you know loans go up by this percent, how do I adjust for that? How do I keep the cash that I need? How do I, you know, how do I improve efficiencies and stuff like that? I mean, and that's that's things that that all of us can help companies with, but it's also things that companies can help themselves with. They know, you know, how to how to improve their efficiencies. They may need help, but they know how to do it and they should start doing it now rather than when the rate increase hits and they're sitting there going, Okay, the world just fell apart. How do I resolve it? Well, well Mark, you, you had a you had a great uh, point, and and you know, of course, all of us in the turnaround profession would love if if uh, the companies hired us to do these things. Mm -hmm. But even better yet, and it hurts my heart to say this, even better yet, if the company could figure it out on themselves and make these changes, if they can, that's the best route to go. And I've I've told I've told. Uh, you know, when we've met with companies, I've said, you know, I, I don't care if you hire us or don't, but you need to do these things. And, and that, you know, otherwise you're going to be in trouble. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Do if, we have any more questions, more Eric, or no? All right. I think Eric? we're about, we're, we're going to wrap up. If each of the three of you, John, and then, uh, and then uh, Mark and then Dennis would just give like a closing comment about, you know, for our audience of let's say entrepreneurs and investors, what you, where you think their opportunity might lie. Uh, that would be great, just in a couple sentences. And then I would encourage our audience members who are interested in being proactive and taking advantage, adding value and harvesting it. Uh, to reach out to our panelists to uh, to get involved. Um, so if, if I understand the question is where the opportunities are for companies. Yeah, what should a, a, a audience member who's got some capital and some talent, what should he do now to uh, take advantage of the current climate? Uh, I find find the hidden gems. Uh, find, I mean, personally, I would say pursue the companies that are... Uh, um, I really got a lot of hair on them. Um, nobody's talking to them. Um, there's not, not an auction for them. Uh, but again, as we said previously, the company has got good bones. You can see very clearly how the business can get improved and how you're going to make a lot of money if you do so. Exactly. It, it's looking at, at that, you know, uh, at that company that's got a ton of warts, but you can see past that and see how uh, that can be the future and a very bright future. Uh, you got to put the work into it. Uh, but if you, if you look at those organizations, then there's probably not going to be a lot of other people looking at them. And so, you know, your investment in that company could be lower than if it's in an auction situation where a lot of people are looking and a lot of people are saying, hey, we can... Uh, we can do a few things and we're willing to add a few more shekels to the pot uh, and make sure that we get it. So uh, again, it's, it's timing as well. When are you looking at these things? You know, are you looking at them when the company does want to put that for sale sign on the front lawn or because they're disgusted um, or is it, uh, is it later on when that company is, is on the road to recovery? So yeah, as an investor, maybe you want to do it when the when the signs on the front lawn. Uh, as a company owner, you probably want to wait a little bit and have your ducks in a row. Okay, great, Dennis. You want to wrap up? Yeah, I uh, I agree with what these guys are saying. I think the opportunity within industries where people all know each other, uh, you know, you've got a couple of competitors that aren't the best, or you know, you make red and blue wheels, and you wish you could make black wheels. So you, you step out. I just think that those of us that are helping these companies need to encourage them to be proactive about opportunities. Don't wait for somebody to knock on the door. Get out in front, uh, be part of it. Because let's face it, everybody wants to be part of a winner. And so why not get there early 
and get somebody to go along with you. So I agree with what these guys said. But once again, I go back to my beginning comments. I think it's a great period of opportunity. Let's take advantage of it and help people win. Okay, let me thank our panelists. We have three legends in the turnaround business and they're here to help you take advantage of opportunities. And with that, let me turn it over to Eric for the networking portion of our program. Thank you.